Good morning, everyone. My name is Hiren Binde. I head uh, product management for ARVR at Qualcomm, and I'm excited to introduce our panelists today. We are going to be talking about 5G edge compute and XR. And I know that 5G edge compute and XR have been three terms that have been widely used uh, over the past 48 hours in this uh, conference, and a lot of people do want to see how the whole thing comes together. Okay, so there's 5G being deployed, there's edge computing that's probably already working, XR, we hear of these headphone devices, but how does everything come together? What are uh, the key challenges in everything coming together? And what needs to be done for each one of you here, either as a developer or the CEO of a media company or uh, just as an advertiser? And that's something that we plan to address today as a part of our panel. Just before we get started, I want to know how many of you are familiar with uh, edge compute in general? I mean, uh, can you guys just give me a show of hands? OK. And how many of you are familiar with uh, how 5G and XR comes in together? All right. OK. So I think uh, this gives me a good insight into what uh, details we want to get into as a part of this topic. So without further ado, I'd like to call on stage our uh, diverse set of panelists and awesome panelists today, starting with J.R. Dawkins, who is the Innovations Program Manager at Verizon Media. We have Alicia Seem, who is the Principal Engineer at uh, AT&T Foundry. I think they're still getting <laughs> mic'd up. Still getting mic'd up. <laughs> we can banter for a little bit. I know. I One more minute. I think we just got the other panelists off stage, so we're still getting mic'd up. Uh, in the meanwhile, though, for Edge Compute and 5G to just give you a quick overview on what we plan to cover today was uh, we're going to start with discussing some of the use cases on how Edge Compute and 5G and XR come together. And I've, uh, we had a quick chat this morning with some of the panelists, and we decided, you know what, Edge Compute is an overloaded term. So why don't we just start by discussing what Edge Compute really means, uh, because there's a lot of confusion on how Edge Compute's used in the telecom world versus Silicon Valley versus the developer world. So we'd like definitely to uh, touch base on that as well. So I think they're all ready now. So Alicia Seem, Principal Engineer at AT&T Foundry. Ali, uh, uh, Ali Daniali, Principal Engineer at T-Mobile. Uh, Terry, uh, Director of Immersive Technology for 5G at Deutsche Telekom. And Nima Sham, who heads the Advanced Product Development at Realware Inc. Good morning, everyone. Uh, there is a special request for this morning from Terry. He wanted to make sure that we have a real fireside chat. And so uh, if you, I, I think we should keep the bag here. Okay. <laughs> this bag deserves to be, so. It's our own fire. As you can see, our panelists are pretty well prepared for uh, today. So good morning, everyone. What I'd like to start with is, if you wouldn't mind, uh, just give a quick introduction of uh, your role at your company and uh, what you guys do there, as well as a one, one minute overview on how your company is associated with 5G, edge compute, and XR. So Nima, why don't we start with you? Hi, my name's Nima Shams. Uh, I'm head of uh, advanced product development at Realware. Um, Realware is a knowledge transfer company that's focused on bringing the digital transformation to the industrial worker. Um, our HMT1 product enables the worker to become a sensor to understand from the environment he is and receive digital data from the cloud to become more efficient in what they do. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to the panel. Oh, you're welcome. We're excited to have you on the panel. Uh, Teddy. So I'm the director of immersive technology at Deutsche Telekom. Um, Deutsche Telekom is the uh, parent company of T-Mobile uh, based out of Germany. We're the leading NACO in Europe. And, uh, my focus there is to look at how we can combine uh, 5G edge compute and XR technologies to provide value to the ecosystem and help us move the needle forward and ultimately reaching consumer class use case development and deployment. Uh, Ali. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm Ali Daniali. I'm principal engineer, part of our engineering core team uh, in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, what I do all day is really AR, VR, IoT, and edge computing. Um, my goal is to get rid of the phone and put it on your, uh, on glass, building all the technology, infrastructures, and content that get, will get us there. Great. 
Um, Alicia Seem, I work at, I'm an engineer at the AT&T Foundry in our Palo Alto location here. Um, I also lead our uh, Edge Computing Zone, or EC Zone program. Um, we have been working in the Edge Computing and 5G space for a couple years now, um, specifically around XR. So the goal of our program is to work with our external technology ecosystem, everything from, you know, the server hardware, the cloud stack, the network stack, all the streaming and um, compression application software, uh, the content itself, all the way down to the devices, um, XR devices, the you know, chipsets doing the decoding and the content and experiences itself, and bring everything together um, into one lab, one test lab, one program, so that everyone can learn from each other to inform not only um, how they should all be fitting together and how all these technologies come together, but then also inform the design of our uh, 5G and edge computing infrastructure. Nice. JR. JR Dawkins, Innovation Program Manager at Verizon Media. Um, we are the combination of the AOL and Yahoo acquisitions, so we're a big house of brands. Um, I'm focused on evaluating technology and seeing how we can transform businesses within the company. So whether that's HR, looking at recruiting and diversity and learning and development, um, also involved in innovation uh, projects ac across Verizon Media, so transforming uh, news delivery, um, looking at things like vocap and how do we um, <coughs> provide content in the future, right, with these new headsets and platforms. Um, and everyone at Verizon, of course, also has the side assignment of figuring out how do we build out this 5G ecosystem. So we work with partners and, and we're thinking of ideas to make it meaningful so that when the networks do go live that we have some meaningful things on it and all the money was well spent. Nice. So uh, thank you, everyone. I think I'd like to begin with uh, you, Terry. You've spoken about this in, at some of the places as well. Edge computing, and I think edge computing is a super loaded term. I've, uh, you know, I've, as an employee of Qualcomm, I've, when I speak to folks on the SOC side and when I speak to folks uh, who work on 4G, 5G, as well as when we work with our partners out here in Silicon Valley on the cloud partners, uh, I do see that the way that term's used can be very different for different people. And one thing that I'd like to begin with you is sharing what's your view from uh, and giving like an overall view of edge compute to our audience. So I, I would explain it the way I would explain it to my grandmother. Yes, that'd you know? be awesome. Because um, otherwise we'll be here talking about AI in you know, 50 different subtopics and going on. So really for me, edge compute is fundamentally about taking the compute function of the internet and bringing it as close to the user as possible in the most simple way making things faster. So um, if we are able to know where all of the physical hardware is of uh, telco or AWS or some sort of you know, cloud platform, and we can create a map of that, we can figure out where the user is at a given moment in time and figure out where the physical hardware is closest to that user that will provide the services needed by the application the user wants to run. We can tell that server to spin those services up and connect it to the user directly. And if we can do that intelligently, we can transform the amount of time it takes um, on average from say 110 milliseconds down to you know, 25 or 30. And ultimately when we layer 5G radio on top of that, we can get it under 10. And when we can transform the, the, the latency in the network to in the 10 to 20 millisecond range, that means we can start developing use cases like VR that run off the network. And then we can have the changes of pose and how people move around, that data can go to the network and the comp computation can be done on the network and brought back to the user fast enough so that they don't feel you know, the lag and, and the, the motion sickness in VR, which is the harder problem to solve. And then with, with AR, we don't need quite that performance. So it's even easier and more beneficial for AR. Nice. And Alicia, I know that you guys work on edge compute as well. So do you guys, how do you see as a part of the uh, work that you do on where the, is, is this all going to be on servers that are closer to the user or do you guys also consider the device itself as a part of the edge? Um, well, I think you were right to say, first of all, that edge is a very loaded term. Um, and 
it, it's complicated and it's been messy and through a lot of different conversations over the years, kind of what is the edge? Everyone asks, where is the edge physically? What does that even mean? And I think we have to understand that um, with the network edge, we're actually creating something new. So it is hard to describe it in terms of, in, in the kind of traditional terms we've been talking about. So, you know, I mean, historically in the last like 20 years, or not 20 years, I don't even know how old I am, but, um, <laughs> But when people talk about edge computing, a lot of what you'll find is people talking about the device edge. So edge computing, especially in the Valley, a lot of times refers to um, like embedded systems, embedded right. chipsets. So like you would be familiar with Qualcomm. When you, if you talk to someone in the cloud space, they mean edge in terms of kind of what Terry was referring to, just kind of taking the centralized cloud basically and pulling it out and giving it more physical proximity to the end user to reduce the amount of latency, reduce the access time. Um, and so you'll talk about, you know, all, all these cloud companies are developing an edge, which just means more points of presence, smaller data centers, closer to the user. What we're actually creating, at least from the point of view of our edge computing zone program in the Foundry, is something diff that's different from both and kind of tries to merge the two. Because it's not as simple as just taking a traditional, um, you know, cloud stack that would be in a centralized cloud and pulling it physically closer to the end user. Right. That doesn't work. It sounds nice that, you know, we say, oh, we're going to reduce the number of milliseconds it takes to access that. We're going to have, you know, this much points of presence, but it doesn't actually work that way. What we're creating is not a device edge. It's not a cloud edge. It is the network edge. And that means, yes, it means kind of bringing the power of cloud computing, but also giving it the efficiency of device edge. So these, this Network edge has to be designed first and foremost to serve and connect those devices, not to bring information outward the way that the traditional centralized cloud is designed. Excellent. So um, I think in summary, we're bringing a lot of the processing power from the cloud down to the edge to help with these devices and the experiences. And um, I'd like to also talk about how these experiences or what these experiences are. I think all of us here are with our, uh, with our common love for AR and VR, uh, one of the things that when we talk about the experiences in the VR AR world is of course the motion to photon latency. If I'm wearing my VR device, find myself in the middle of Manhattan, and if I look at the right, I want to make sure that I actually see uh, the Times Square or I see the Hard Rock Cafe rather than it coming a few seconds later and making me sick. So these, this is just one example of where we want to do latencies, but can you uh, share what kind of experiences uh, are we working on, especially from a cloud edge uh, perspective? So, JR, I know you look a lot into the experiences side as well. Uh, would you mind giving some insight into what kind of technologies you guys are evaluating and use cases evaluating uh, with this aspect? Yeah, I mean, so uh, when I was in the environment team, we were focused on things like split, split rendering, um, XR lighting, and, and you know, having uh, a computer vision all run in the network. Um, on mobile edge, so those those things enable you to basically like alleviate the devices and handsets to not be burdened, and then the the designers of the programs can then push the quality down to the devices. So those those are some of the things. So that might look like basically taking what we would do with a desktop level a computer, but allowing a phone to consume that. Right, that's awesome. And Nima, I know you work on uh, devices and right. from ODG to realware, these are, like you've seen uh, different use cases on the enterprise side and on the consumer side as well. What kind of experiences do you think is uh, something that the customers are demanding right now? And how soon do you think edge compute is going to be a crucial part of this? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, the evolution of uh, mobile devices is completely changing, you know, but 5G, you're going from 4G, which was a phone-centric system, to a, a system that's now decentralized, where everything is a sensor, everything is interconnecting. On the device side, that allows you to use your compute more sparsely, because stuff is happening in the cloud with far less latency. So the product can shrink, the battery can shrink, the form factor can shrink. On the industrial side, what we're seeing is now because all these sensors are continuously attached to each other, you're going from a reactive model to a predictive model. So you don't have to wait for a machine to go down to then react to it and repair it. The sensors, the ambient computer 
informs the user prior to something occurring that, hey, the data is a little off. And 5G enables that uh, decentralization of information and continuous collaboration of information. So what we're seeing from our customer base like Honeywell and Cisco and some of our industrial partners uh, like Uros is that they're beginning to use all the sensor data together with the wearable device to predict problems and resolve them. What kind of use cases would you say where, when you're moving from a reactive model to a predictive model, what kind of use cases uh, where we'll see these differences immediately? Yeah, uh, I mean, it could be uh, visual computing. You know, you, you could have all these sensors that see thermal on machinery, and if there's a delta in the thermal, it becomes a trigger. Sound, you could begin to see, con you're consistently connected. The three fundamental things that 5G gives us is broad bandwidth, it gives us extreme low latency, but it gives us a very reliable and always on type of system. And so now this data is all being plumbed and a user wearing an HMT1 type of device gets that data right at the edge, right at the line. And so before a problem could even arise, he has that information and, co and addresses it before something major happens. And we're seeing a huge transformation. You know, Wi-Fi is great, but 5G takes you to the next level. It allows all of these sensors to be just continuously giving their data and being used you know, smartly. Nice. So Ali, um, you know, I wanted to discuss about the use cases and the definition first and then come to you to ask, when do we see this happening? I, mean, I know you're one of those people who's right there in the labs making things happen. Uh, is this, is edge compute true today? Is this something that could be used today? We have the real-way devices now. There are folks uh, who are working on these applications. How soon does edge compute, the marriage of edge compute, 5G, and XR really come to fruit? In? Or is, are, is this going to happen in phases? Uh, well, it's here already <coughs> I mean, with Mobile Edge X. They're, they have the, um, the data centers, and they're all within the edge, um, very close to the, to the user. Um, the whole definition of edge becomes critical in knowing how those applications are going to actually be built, right? Um, where there was a transformative change in development when we built applications um, into the cloud, there's, there's gonna be that same transformative programmatic change when we're building for edge. And this is something that that people have to learn. Even when we have 5G in place, understanding how you actually get the most out of it is going to be something you gotta learn, right? Um, how do you really, you, you talk about low latency, but typical applications right now that rely on cloud, low latency isn't necessarily the, uh, something you can control, right? You can control that in a 5G environment. You can get tiers of service in a 5G environment. And you can pay to have better service levels in a 5G. So the, the whole monetization of 5G is, is um, one of the things that makes it very valuable. And we think about, at T-Mobile, we're thinking about how do we really bring it out for everybody? Not just you know, you know, one particular solution, but all kinds of developers. How do they really can utilize 5G with edge computing to build those very high-performing applications? I see. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, Alicia, how do you see that happening in phases as well from an AT&T Foundry perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's going to come out in phases. Edge is going to come out in phases. 5G is coming out, of fa out in phases. And kind of like Ali was saying, it's going to take time for people to learn actually how to utilize 5G and edge computing and how to design their applications to leverage that kind of new tier of the internet or whatever it is. Um, but there are applications that are coming and that are here today. And actually, one thing I'm excited to talk about, and I, I rushed all of our teams to make sure we could get the blog posted this morning so I could be approved to talk about it nice. on this panel. We just um, completed some testing with uh, our Vizio, uh, a mixed reality company that um, kind of has this remote rendering platform for 
that, that can be used for uh, rendering large-scale models for industrial design. And that's one of actually, for me, one of the most compelling value-adding applications that's available today. Nice. Um, you're already seeing in industries like aerospace, automotive, et cetera, you're seeing cost savings, time savings, reduced time to production. When you're able to um, you know, take these highly detailed, large-scale models, if you think about it, these industries have been developing these models for decades the way you kind of design an airplane with all the different details, all the different parts that fit together um, in construction. They, they do captures of sorry, um, like millions and billions of, of LIDAR points that are stitched together into a point cloud. But the way everyone's had to visualize them before is a very non-intuitive 2D format where you kind of basically have these CAD wizards that know how to use all the different mouse and all the different keystrokes to get things to rotate. Right. Even back when we were doing you know, CAD design in school, you have to take the time. It's so hard to get these models to rotate where you want, to put the annotations in the right place. And especially you know, if you're trying to do something collaboratively, it's a very clumsy, non-intuitive intuitive environment that is such a compelling use case for mixed reality. And it really is, once you try it, you can actually you know, bring it up to a life-size scale and walk through the boat like you're in the boat and see all the different parts, move things around. But you, it's very hard with the capabilities of existing, even premium existing um, mixed reality headsets to be able to render that high of a poly count um, on the device itself or to render you know, that many billions of points of your LiDAR mesh on the device itself. There's just not enough processing power on the device to do what you want to do. So they end up kind of dropping the frame rate, dropping the resolution, compromising in other ways, or it just won't let you load it, basically. And what um, our Visio has done is remove that rendering um, power from the device and kind of allow the uh, created a distributed model for the headset to work with a backend server. But obviously, that relies on the link. And what we've kind of been able to show with them is that you know traditionally they would do all of this over Wi-Fi. 4G is certainly not feasible with the latency and the speeds that you need, and also as you were saying, the kind of um, reliability that you need. But we were able to port it over to a 5G and edge computing testbed and show that you can have that seamless experience. Nice. And what we're excited about with that is that 5G actually brings the ubiquity and the multi-user experiences that you can't have with Wi-Fi alone. That's amazing. So that's timely. So we have an enterprise use case that's showcased today using the edge compute capabilities and with a big partner like AT&T and Arizio. So interesting to know. I know that uh, you had an amazing use case uh, that was recorded this morning. Yeah. Uh, used on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that was recorded on a smartphone. Uh, for So would you uh, just give a quick overview on what that is before we turn on the uh, video? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in, in <laughs> using and showing the technology that we talk about and just and not throwing PowerPoints up. So, right. um, and also I wanted to, to focus on the word, the are enabling versus will enable. Yes. Right? So. Um, we have, um, in Germany, we have Edge Compute Cloud that's currently live, running and covers the whole, the whole country of Germany. And there's a, Edge you know, spinning, a Cloud that's spinning up you know, globally right now. So what we did is we worked with a company called Forward Game in, in, uh, in Germany to develop a, um, a two-player air hockey um, uh, game running um, on an Edge Cloud that, that's here in California. And so the mobile game basically connects the, to the cloud that synchronizes player position on uh, the, um, uh, the air hockey puck position and the score data uh, in real time um, nice. over the, the network. Awesome. Um, so so the, 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 we, we, because of space on the stage, we were going to do a live demo. But we realized we weren't going to have enough room. So we, um, right before the show opened this morning, uh, Ali and I and a colleague of ours from Mobile Edge X, which is providing the <coughs> ecosystem that we're using, um, recorded a video which we, we have that we can show. Uh, to demonstrate that this is real today and not something that we're just talking about in the future. Excellent. So um, our, for our tech team in the back, can we please uh, turn on the video, please? Oh. <laughs> turn the volume down. So you can see the, uh, the synchronization going on between the player movements. <laughs> Score! <laughs> this is all about him getting yeah. scoring. He got me back. <laughs> nice. See? 
the audio and the video are a little out of sync. But the, um, so basically what you were seeing there is that as we were moving our phone and our body, um, that was um, being translated into controller position. And then that position was being synced between all the players. And, and actually what you were seeing there was the view from a spectator phone. So there was a separate mobile phone that was giving us a, a spectator view on the experience. So that was also getting a synchronized view of, of what was going on. But most importantly, you won? No, um, well, that's I, unfairly, maybe because I practice a little bit more. Than this. A lot more practice. <laughs> yeah, but I think the key, the key highlight, as you mentioned, was uh, if you realize that it's it's not something. Over the past few years, we've always been talking about XR devices and 5G and edge computers, something that's going to eventually happen. But the fact that we are seeing this happen today, and the word that you use, it's are enabling mm -hmm. instead of saying will enable. Uh, it's it's a leap of uh, technology progress that we're seeing happening. Yep. And as a, yep. you know, I, I've been working on smartphones for the last 13, 14 years at, at Qualcomm to the first Android device and so on and so forth. But as a true XR fanboy, uh, while I loved what Pokemon Go has to offer in this game, I can't wait for all this happening on glasses with a 5G module and things like that. To which, from the applications and use cases, how do you all in your own respective industries see uh, the cloud players taking a step further for 5G and XR. And the reason I ask this question is, 4G was a big deal 10, 15 years ago when downloading a movie or the downloading pictures, would we would have some latencies and issues doing that on 3G. And 4G came in, but then there were companies like YouTube and Netflix and HBO and uh, all the other folks, including Uber, who made use of these channels, this pipe, to not only monetize themselves really well, but also change the industry uh, in the way these, this technology is being used. Do we see people being really excited about 5G? Has it just been talk, or do we see people taking actionable steps for both mobile and eventually leading up to glasses? I'm just going to throw this question open to anyone, and I'll leave it to any of you to uh, take it. But I would love to hear everybody's view of this. Well, I, I just want to throw one comment in, which is the pervasive part of our topic, right? Yes. So for me, one of the big um, payoffs that I would explain is the fact that it's a, it, we can create shared experiences. So our company motto is life is for sharing. And for me, it's a big passion of mine to create you know, sort of community and, and actually um, move us away from the sort of distracted phone, you know, heads down model to a communal social heads up model of interaction. Right. And I think, you know, as we, we move to head worn, we, you know, the use cases will um, embrace that concept a lot more aggressively. Right now it's a very siloed space. You know, I, I look at my phone, I'm running my app. Um, don't bother me. Maybe you'll interrupt me with notifications remotely, but it's not a shared thing. And we play Pokemon Go and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with 20 people, you know, attacking a portal or a rate, you know, rating, and it, we're all standing next to each other, but we're not really playing together, you know? Right. And so um, that'll change. And I think um, uh, as we um, go into um, the, the use of headsets and we're, we're heads, heads up, um, we're going to see a lot of transformation in the way applications are developed, and more importantly, how the application ecosystem is presented to developers. So I talk very briefly, uh, uh, you know, about um, this idea that you know, when, currently on head-worn devices, we're still very app-centric. Scroll, 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 tap, launch an app. And what I think will be transformative is with the um, integration of Edge and 5G together and all the value propositions that they bring to the table um, is that we'll be able to have, um, I put my glasses on in the morning and, and my glasses turn on and I have a, a pervasive ecosystem of services that work together based on my personal needs, even perhaps the persona that I, am I, am I a my work persona, am I on my vacation persona, am I at my family time persona? But do you see, uh, Teddy, that if the same view yeah. is being uh, pushed forward or by the big cloud players as well? And the reason I ask this question is, I do, I think all of us, uh, mostly in this room, who are yeah. here with the love of XR, uh, are aligned on the vision of this whole communal feeling and going from this to this, right. do we see uh, other folks taking actionable steps, especially the folks with that clout uh, who've been on the application side and the user experience side I, I think on smartphones? I think you are in the sense of like microservices becoming a more foundational way that we build software. Right. And the idea of you know, to sort of um, uh, decentralizing and, 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 um, and breaking down you know, the architectural model of applications so that 
I, I have these more discrete sort of functions that I can reach onto the network um, and, 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 and utilize to build my application experience. So absolutely, I think that fundamental concept is gonna enable the developers to think differently about how they build apps and it's not this monolithic, you know, I mean, think of like Uber is probably the best example of microservices implementation where they think they have 2,000 microservices operating their entire um, uh, mobile app platform. Right. So I think it's, um, to your point, I think it's, we have to acknowledge that it's hard to be excited about something when you don't know what you can do with it and you don't yeah. know how to use it's early it. Days. Um, and it's early days and it's been early days for years. I mean, I've been working in this space, like I don't, my background is not in graphics or consumer technology at all. I've been working in this space for a couple of years and I'm, I'm actually not a you know, fan girl or enthusiast of any type of co consumer devices. And I think I, we have all, probably all of us have kind of ridden through all the ebbs and the flows, the hype, the disillusionment, the hype, the disillusionment, and it's, it's difficult for me to get excited about a lot of these different experiences, but I, we still do. The reason we have this collaboration program is because we see the potential. It's hard for anyone to get excited about 5G and edge computing when you don't know how to use it for your own software application or what to do with it, which is why we bring these companies in. We have them design and test on this, uh, the 5G test bed we have with Ericsson and Santa Clara here, and actually then stitch together all the different components because otherwise everyone's just waiting for each other. So you have to stitch together the content, the devices, the chipsets, the compression technology, the server technology, the GPUs, the virtualization, the cloud stack, the hardware itself, the network, all of those pieces have to fit together to actually show the power of what you can do. I don't think we've developed a compelling enough gold standard yet for enough people to be excited about it, but I think we're all, like, all of us in this room remain committed that we're gonna get there. Well, we're very excited about 5G, especially yeah. real 5G, not fake. So what we're trying to do is- fake 5G. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, we want to bring 5G for everybody, uh, not just the corner around the corner. Uh, so what, what is really exciting, the cloud folks is gaming, right? Right. And we partner with those players and the, the ability to create an experience that you're not lugging around mm -hmm. a lot of equipment to do what right now has you know a twelve hundred three thousand dollar computer can do, and touching off on the remote rendering right. piece, I think that's a really powerful piece that connects five G and um, cloud computing, edge computing, and I and I keep talking about um, really this whole thing is a, a, a stool with three legs, you know it's five G, it's the infrastructure with edge computing, and then it's the content. Right. One, one <clears throat> without the other is really not that pervasive, <laughs> but you've got to have all three of them really to, to get those use cases solved. And but also kind yeah. of t thinking about XR and remote rendering like in and of itself, for and by itself, is a very reductionist way to approach it, and it's never gonna be that exciting. It's when we actually have 5G and Edge and the ability to stitch together all the sensors, all the vehicles, all the mapping, and stitch that whole spatial computing AI-driven world together. Because, I mean, our phones are not phones, you know, for and by themselves. An AR headset is just a viewing portal, basically, right. into this spatial computing world. So when we, that's why, so in our program, we work on a couple different, like we have a couple different missions. We call them, you know, map, HD mapping for vehicle automation, sensor fusion for public safety, and cutting the cord on XR and gaming. But these are, but the point of what these are, these are not separate industries. It is the visualization component, the perception component and the representation component, all of this AI-driven spatial computing world. And when we stitch all of those together, that's when your AR headset actually becomes compelling and useful, rather than like, I'm just walking around in a world and seeing Charizard. So, I so I, you know, I've been in this space for over 10 years, right? 10 years ago, before AWE, it was ARE, and it was like Ori and four card tables, and there was like, you know, no one, and Ori was at all the card tables, right? Um, so as you can see, uh, the industry has evolved quite a bit in that 10 years. Um, it's interesting because I am a gamer, and I think gaming always does push the forefront of all types of yeah. technology. The unique factor I see with XR is that when an object is on your face, it's fashion. 
right? So unless that object looks amazing and disappears and enables you on the consumer side, you are going to see a lot of friction. There's some really good image quality being built by, by some companies here. There's some really good compute, but for a truly consumer-focused device, it's the fashion, it's a representation of you because it's your face. However, on the industrial side at Realware, what I'm beginning to realize, and I'm fairly new at Realware, is that there's a huge demand and hunger for that connected worker because it allows him to do his job right. What we're seeing is there's this tribal knowledge that's been built, and as baby boomers are retiring, that tribal knowledge is lost. And you have this new generation of millenniums coming in, and they're used to gadgets and technology, and now they have to go back to paper and pencil? That's not gonna work. So they stick around for a year and a half, two years, and then they leave, because that innovation and in industry isn't there. So we're seeing a huge pull from the industrial companies saying, bring us edge compute, bring us wearables, bring us this thing that allows us to become more efficient, because it gets our job done. One example is Porsche, and, and their head-worn device, and they're seeing a 40% uh, increase or decrease in time to repair a complicated Porsche with a wearable device and an expert somewhere else, either at the edge or in Germany, helping them. So it's very interesting seeing both, side of, both sides of the market. Yeah, then, I, sorry, uh, I just, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add real quick. Um, so from, from the cloud perspective, I feel like the, the excitement they have is looking at all the devices that are gonna be available for their services that's on line, right? So you look at what um, Google has with Stadia and, and the other programs, what Microsoft is doing with Azure. And you know, the, the excitement there is that, you know what, we're gonna get billions more devices on here and they're preparing services now to kind of be ready to cross over. Um, so as these devices get smaller, the networks come online, then the cloud players are like, great, now we have more right. um, ability to scale revenue because we have these services ready and running. Um, even Amazon with their, their like research with drone delivery and these different things, you know, it's like they're prepping for this, right? So they're testing the drones out and they're seeing how this works and you're like, why is Amazon there? But they've, they've been building out their cloud and their infrastructure and their back end. so as soon as 5G is ready, they're like, great, we've been working on drones, we've got the network, we've got the services, here's another scale of revenue for us. Um, they're so. also kind of seeing it as an inevitable shift back to the edge because, mm. you know, when, when computing started it was, for, you know, for enterprises, it was very on-premise, and then PC came, and we sh PCs came, and we shifted to a much more distributed model of computing when we started to build out the first generation of the internet. Then, in the last, you know, in the uh, 2010s or 2000s, we shifted back to a centralized model with these cloud players and centralized cloud computing, and a lot of the data generation intelligence happening. Um, in a more centralized way, and now we're shifting once again to a much more distributed model where all the data generation is happening at the edge on these billions of emerging devices, and the cloud players now have to figure out, okay, how do we kind of keep up with this distributed model and trend, and how do we redesign our infrastructure? Not that the centralized cloud is going anywhere, but the edge is going to start to dominate for sure. Right, so it looks like... dovetail off this. One of the, the ways that I describe to folks, what is 5G gonna do for me, right? right? Um, I bring up the whole Pokemon Go experience right now where you're carrying, you see everyone carrying the extra battery pack, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that happens because all that compute is happening on the phone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you come in, into an edge environment, that compute doesn't happen on the phone, right? It happens at the edge. So you use less power, so that's one thing that's gonna happen. That, your location services increase in a centimeter accuracy. So you're gonna have less, again, less battery draw. So you're gonna have phones that eventually they're gonna go, why do I need more compute on this phone? Right? And right. people are gonna go, well, why do I have to upgrade this phone? Because I, I've got an iPhone 6 and it works just fine because the app's being streamed to me. So eventually this is the, 5G and edge computing is this first nail in the coffin mm -hmm. for what we know as the phone going away, right? And it's gonna 
where is it going to be? It's going to be on glass. Well, even when you think about, like, when you're talking about the battery packs, if, you, if any of you guys have ever done those location-based VR experiences. So I, mm -hmm. I just did one recently, and um, they're ones where you're kind of, you're in a room, there are a lot of different sensors, it's a really cool immersive VR experience, but you have to sit there for 10 minutes before you do the 10 minute experience and put on all your sensors and put on this giant backpack. And this poor little kid next to me is wearing a <laughs> backpack that weighs just as much as he does. And we're walking around and this kid is lumbering around with a backpack because you are, you're wearing a headset and you have a PC with a GPU card strapped on your back. So what we're working on now in our, in our program with a lot of our partners is cutting the cord and decoupling that PC backpack, putting it elsewhere so you're just wearing the headset itself. Yep. So, um, I mean, like the, there's this bandwidth aspect, there's the accuracy aspect for uh, edge compute, but it also looks like other than bandwidth accuracy and latency, one of the things that you mentioned before the call is also how it's going to help with power consumption. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. other benefits of edge compute that we haven't been aware of. My, uh, I mean, in, in summary, especially for this particular topic is, <clears throat> you mentioned, and it's, it's interesting to hear uh, the perspective coming from telcos here, is that the three pillars of the stool are 5G, edge, and content. Uh, because the way I've always been thinking about this is, it's 5G or connectivity. There's content, and then there's the devices. Because I think that the devices, uh, if you have the whole 5G uh, and edge infrastructure ready, and if you have content that's being built, but if we uh, don't have devices like the ones that you're wearing right now that we could wear all day long, the consumption of that technology is going to be slightly weak as well. So uh, from the marriage of all these factors coming together, yes. when do you think we, we, we'll see some of these glasses that could be worn all day long, especially for enterprise? Yeah, when, when are we going to have a chair instead of a stool? <laughs> So, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit and just maybe quickly talk about the evolution. You know, us humans, there's three fundamental things about us, right? We're curious, we're social, and we're mobile. And any mobile computer that comes to replace it has to address the friction to those three things better. You know, if you had a desktop computer, you will go to a room, you isolate yourself, but you connect it to the web. Then a laptop came, you can move it around, but you need to plug it in. Now you have a phone and you can pull it out and interact with it. The problem with the phone is there's that friction. It's always in your pocket. You have to pull the information and stuff have the information push on you. So the natural evolution of that is a wearable device that's on your face that pushes the right information to you. I think one aspect we're missing in those three, uh, three stools is the AI and machine learning, AI, neural network, whatever you want to call it. And the reason that's important is this dev device you're wearing is now between your eyes and your reality. So it needs to become smarter than you. It needs to know when to engage you with what information and how. You know, we did, uh, at my previous company, we had a project with BMW, and you were driving the car, and it realized when you were in the car, everything was deactivated except for the speedometer, because that could be dangerous. When you left the car, more information came to you. So the device has to start learning. In an industrial factory, when you're working with heavy machinery, the last thing you need is a distraction or a software update, which can cause a huge problem. So the other missing aspect is that AI. Uh, I think to answer your question, sorry, that was really long to get to your answer of your question, is that you're gonna see phased approaches. What real where HMT1 is, is an assisted reality device. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really augment, but it assists. It knows where you are, the camera detects what you're seeing, and it gives you like the manual for that information. Or if you're doing a task, it knows what task you're doing and starts recording it for you. Next leap, you know, part of the roadmap is then becoming more immersive, overlaying and becoming augmented reality and then followed by volumetric data and realizing where you are in that space and interacting with it. So I, I, I think you're seeing that evolution. You know, I don't want to you know, pat ourselves on the back, but we just did a 10,000 unit order with Uros and uh, oil refineries in Kazakhstan. That's 10,000 head-worn devices that a company said we will invest in because it makes our job more efficient. And edge computing, 5G, allows those devices to become more and more efficient because now they're always communicating with each other. So Absolutely. I think you're seeing that trend now. Uh, and AWE is, again, a really good litmus test. Look at over 7,000 attendees this year. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's just growing because the world is realizing this is the next mobile computer. 
Nice. Yeah, I think uh, I mean I'm really happy to see the excitement of shipping 10,000 units. I, I think like about 15, 20 years ago, there must have been somebody somewhere who must have said, we just shipped 10,000 of these big smart, <laughs> of big phones, mobile yeah. phones, and look where we are here today, almost uh, two and a half billion smartphones uh, in the world. So uh, I have a lot of more questions, and I'd also like to request our folks in the back to see if there are any questions up on Slido. If there's anything interesting, I'd like to pull that up as well. Uh, one of the key things, especially from the uh, telcos here, is how is the thought process different for 5G as compared to 4G uh, in terms of the monetization as well as deployment? And I think that's uh, 5G was a huge success in how it made the world a small place. Uh, but then there was also a lot of people who were able to use that and create huge industries out of it. Does, do the telecoms uh, think differently and want to take a step forward in terms of content development and things like that? Or given the key focus uh, with the expertise on infrastructure and network, is that still going to be the focus? Um, yeah, in, in Germany, we're, we, because it's, a, it's going to be an expensive effort to build out the physical infrastructure to fully take advantage of, of 5G benefits, um, we see a lot of demand for campus installation of 5G. So, you know, in terms of building out, you know, large corporate infrastructure, um, putting on-premises 5G, on-premises uh, edge compute. Um, I think, you know, that, that's active now. That's something that's happening. Um, and I think that'll be a, a way for us to effectively subsidize some of the, the cost of building out the infrastructure because we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars collectively to get, you know, just the U.S. and, and Europe, you know, built out. Um, and so that, I think you know, that's one way to do it. The other way we look at it is in terms of our role as a network, in terms of the ecosystem is providing um, more compute services. Uh, and so as we look at the value proposition of edge compute, we say, well, what kind of compute services we can put on the network um, to um, enable these types of use cases to be um, more efficiently produced, more um, um, uh, rewarding financially for the developers? Because the complications um, to build, you know, we talk about full stack, and right. you know, it's the, you know the lamp stack, right? But now it's like a Dagwood sandwich. It's you know, there's so many layers to the stack. It's a, a sandwich I can never get my mouth around, um, right. and so it's too complicated for a lot of indie developers to even conceive of right. building an edge compute application. So it needs to be simplified for them. And we look at we look at the making the entry point simplified, and we also look at what kind of services layers we can put on the network to make um, them not have to invent that wheel over and over again. And, and GR, yeah. is that the same approach that you guys are taking as well? Or uh, because I know that you focus more on the media side as well. Yeah, I was going to say be, beyond the networks and the dev services, we're, we're looking at the features we can offer to the consumers in a much, much deeper way. Because with, with all the previous Gs, it's like, OK, we build out the network and we optimize the network. But now we're looking at what services can we bring to the end users? What features can we bring out there with 5G? Because now it's it's more than just providing service because there, there's there been like a normalization that, that's happened. So we look at like the way we're doing content, right? So we, we have the, the Riot team that's focused on XR content creation. Mm -hmm. um, so we just launched an app uh, this year called Yahoo Play. And in the app, there's a new uh, show on there, and it's an animated character called Hypezilla. I see. That okay. Hypezilla character is actually um, a live actor in a mocap suit. The motion capture is being processed on a 5G node. So the, the rendering time is like eliminated there. Right? right? So we're changing the way that content is being developed and delivered, um, even though the consumers, you know, all they see is a new show, in a sense, right? And then we're looking at different services that we can bring out for the consumers on 5G to say like, okay, 5G enables us now to be more than just this one pipe. Now we can bring a plethora of services and content there. Do the content creators or the application developers have to think differently while, and I'm sure there might be a few here mm -hmm. in the audience as well, while creating stuff for 5G and Edge as compared to what was created for say, the six inch or a five and a half inch mobile screen? Because uh, we've always looked at, you know, for any content developer, it's important, like the visuals are important, the spatial audio is important, the spatial mapping is mm -hmm. important. Now we're going to add some AI components to it. The motion to photon latency to make sure there's no uh, any motion sickness, it's important. 
Now we add another complexity of, hey, what's going to be done on the edge versus 5G? Is this going to be transparent to them? Or? I think for them, it's not necessarily as transparent because what they're seeing, like I used to be in, in media, you know, I worked at Apple for a while and I was doing a lot of teaching of Final Cut, and every video person knows the term rendering. Right. Right. So you make a change, you got to render, and you got to wait for the computer. And every video outfit has the highest level GPUs and the latest computers, but they're still rendering. Right. So with going to the 5G network, rendering is eliminated. Like, so it's like now they're just like, I can create more, I can focus more on telling my story and working my medium, and I don't have to worry about it. So the beauty of 5G is it's removing some of the hurdles and touch points in technology. Uh, wait times out of their way, and they could just focus on doing what they love to do. I, I, I want to say, you know, one of the fundamental things that's going to really transform the developer thinking is um, you have to think now um, in terms of designing for spatial computing environments. That's a big change. You can imagine all the software that we see today is going to be completely redesigned in the next 10 years for spatial computing environments, but also temporal computing. Right. Because you know the big difference is that we just build an app and it runs and it gets things done at whatever time it gets it done and we just it's good enough, you know. But when we have to know about the timing of when things happen and we have to design for that, we have to think in terms of temporal um, delay and and so that's where the edge and latency aspects of 5G uh, matter to the developer in terms of their the ideation of their product and the design of their product. So can you guys put some more color to like split rendering? We sp we've been speaking about split rendering and remote rendering and uh, the bringing the photorealism or the graphics quality of the PCs or the cloud wireless to a VR headset is in summary what we're doing that. But if a content creator is developing that, say for an Oculus uh, Rift or an HTC Vive, but it's also going to be used for a future uh, split rendering device, do they have to do things differently on what's going to be consumed at the cloud versus edge? Not necessarily. Okay. Because like we work with like Unreal, Unity, we give them the the protocols and APIs. So now it's a part of the tools that the creators are using. So create once, deploy all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I know we have uh, five and a half minutes remaining. Uh, folks at the back, do we have any Slido questions, or can we continue with some of the other fun questions that we have here? Up. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> so let me start with this one. How can developers prepare for the massive 5G paradigm shift occurring? Well, that was, I mean, I kind of answered that a little bit in saying right. you have to think in terms of spatial UX, um, you have to think in terms of multi-user UX, and you have to think in terms of uh, temporal you know, aspects, too. Okay. Well, I think there's a, there's a part in this is that us as telcos have to extract those services that you get to use mm -hmm. and will incorporate into your development uh, workflow. And we got to, once we figure out all the different things that we can provide you, we got to provide you those SDKs, those APIs, and incorporate them in cloud services so that it becomes very simple, right? To do that, build once, deploy everywhere. And Terry, you mentioned right. like OpenXR, right? Right. right. Yeah. Got it. From uh, my point of view, I would just make a plug and say, come work with us. Be part of it. Be yeah, part nice. of designing yeah. 5G. That's the whole the whole point. When we um, launched the 5G component of our lab in, in March, we, the event, we called it Designing the Edge. Because mm -hmm. networks and telcos, we're not going to design. It, we shouldn't design the network and hand it to you and say, oh, I thought you would be ready for this. What are you going to do with it now? The whole point right. is kind of iterative back and forth. 5G is a lot more complicated than 4G was. There's so many different components to it. And it's trying to do so many different things. It's not just all about being a transport layer and being the, you know, yeah, the transport exactly. back end. So there are a lot of different things that we will need to consider and that will determine how and when and where we build out 5G. And so we're really looking to all of the application developers to come work with us in our test beds to basically inform the design of 5G. Tell us what APIs you need. Tell us mm -hmm. where you, we need to deploy our radios and servers and stuff. Yeah, it's, we're, we're, not a, we're not a bigger, dumber pipe. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah that, that's the, one of the big, I would think, takeaways is here that with 5G, telcos are really looking to be more involved in yeah. the whole uh, process and not being the, you know, put aside as over the top with uh, mm -hmm. what's yeah. happened with 4G. Right. Um, also, 
5 g is a lot more complicated because there's licensed and, and unlicensed spectrum mm. right um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that businesses can utilize with unlicensed spectrum and work with telcos to help them manage that so cbrs is one of that to be able to really create um, new ways of integrating with 5G in, in a location that they didn't think they had license spectrum to use, but they could still utilize the speed and latency uh, capabilities. Nice. And especially in, in building coverage, right? So. Yeah, I think the, uh, you make a good point on the fact that, as even as Terry mentioned, that it's not just a bigger dumber pie, but there's a lot more intelligence yeah. to how things are being done in different, uh, with the unlicensed spectrum, the licensed spectrum, and being a part of the process and the service itself. I think we are uh, running out of time, but I'd just like to summarize that uh, a few key takeaways that we had today was, of course, 5G is different from 4G on it, just not being a dumber pipe, but there's lots more happening. Alicia, as she said, if there are, you need to come and be a part of the community. If you have questions, uh, most of us will be here uh, backstage, uh, please come and ask how you can work on this particular journey with us. I think Nima uh, shared that humans are curious, social, and mobile. So it is going to happen. It's just a matter of time on how it's going to happen. And going from the reactive to predictive model is something that's just going to be inevitable. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists uh, for the expert opinions today and for entertaining us with your key insights on 5G, Edge Compute, and XR. And thank you very much uh, from the audience as well.